I want to start off, first of all, by thanking the brethren for uh, organizing such an event. We have, uh, we have uh, at home done this a couple of times, and we recognize, of course, the amount of work that goes into it. And it goes without saying, but it is so much appreciated. Now, I must have my say before I begin. Many of you witnessed an event last night. Brother Tim Hutchinson said it will be a night that you will remember forever. It'll be a night you may not ever be able to witness again. And it was, especially for me. But we got awesome God in. I have a grandson, five years old, Cash who told his mom last night was so worried about me, thought I was hauled away in handcuffs. <laughs> yeah, it was an, would have been a new experience too. <laughs> Listen, I know, and it's already been said, that many of us, in fact, I should say all of us, have trials from time to time. Again, there are some in this audience, no doubt, that are going through things in their life that's troubling, that might even tempt to lead them to despair. And before I even begin, I want to say, nothing can lead us to despair if we're connected to Christ. I'll just reiterate what Brother Terry said. That's our connection and what a beautiful opportunity he's given us in the body of Christ to be connected to one another. There is no despair. So I know that you've gone through things or perhaps you're going through things. I have certainly gone through things. And I don't mean to minimize anything that anybody else has gone through. But I'll tell you what, we all face trials. Welcome to life. On May the 23rd, 2013, my life changed forever. I received a phone call that my family and friends had been in a wreck. I asked quickly where they were, and I headed out not knowing what I would find. And on the way there, my brother, Ty, having rolled up on the scene, called me. He said, Leland, there, there's been a wreck. Are you aware? Yes, I am. I'm on my way. He said, I want you to know, Leland, that it's bad. I said, I know, I, I heard that. I'm on my way, I'll, I'll be there. He said, no, Leland. I want you to know, it's very bad. And he was preparing me, of course, for the worst. Of course, I'm speaking of when my wife, along with seven others in the expedition, were in Sy when, uh, if I can get my tongue working, we're in a serious automobile wreck that took Kathy's life. We were two weeks away from our 32nd anniversary. I just want you to know this is my experience. This is my experience. But I was so lost. Brothers and sisters, I don't say this just to dramatize, but I struggled for a full two years to get a grasp and an understanding of what had occurred and how I need to respond to that. It took me a while. I was full of confusion, depression, anger, basically dealing with a good amount of grief. My topic this morning is finding joy in life's trials. How is it that a person can possibly find joy while going through such events? It's almost laughable in the flesh. How can one find peace when dealing with such serious and profound grief? How can anyone find joy and contentment when facing these troubles or persecutions or worry or sickness, uh, disease, death? Is it even possible? Listen, I don't say this arrogantly. I don't. Very cautious. It, it, I almost didn't even want to say this, but I, I think you need to know that there I was, an elder of a congregation, loving life, helping others 
when I could. It even counseled others how to deal with their own troubles and trials, marriage issues, emotional problems, depression, grief, and yes, the death of loved ones. And yet here I was forced to deal with some of the very same issues that I had been working with them on, I had to work on. How could God allow this? Where was God when this event happened in my life? What was I going to do? How was I going to handle things still having four kids at home? Oh, and Janessa. Y'all know Janessa, right? Four years old. Would likely barely, if at all, remember her mother in the years to come. But I want you to know, I was under fire. Not from external conditions, really, not even from the events, but internally, emotionally, spiritually. Not to mention the fact that my kids were all struggling. To start with, three of my children witnessed firsthand the death of their mother. They saw things and images with their own eyes that they will never be able to erase from their mind. I didn't have time to worry about my selfish concerns. How do I help them? And yet I struggled daily to understand. And my dear friends who were in the wreck also and were affected by this. What about them? So many concerns. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 16, Paul writes this, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Did you get that last line? God's will for our lives is to rejoice, to pray, to give thanks in all circumstances. In everything? You've got to be kidding me. How was I supposed to rejoice during this time of my life? How? It wasn't like I woke up the next morning and, and uh, proclaimed, Praise God, I'm so happy. I'm so blessed. I'm so very thankful you brought about this event in my life so that I can be more like you, Lord. I didn't feel that way. How could I possibly give thanks when things like this occurred? Paul, speaking of his trials, expressed it like this in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 10. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, and yet possessing all things. Paul said that even in the sorrowful times, he chose to always rejoice. How could he do that? And how could I learn to do that? 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 9, Peter says this, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. How could Peter suggest that we should greatly rejoice when going through these various trials? Clearly, he didn't know what I was going through. Peter said, in this, greatly rejoice. You greatly rejoice. Well, in what? Back up. Back up three verses. And let's read what he was talking about. Beginning in verse 3, this is the context that he was talking about. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You see, Peter is talking about an eternal perspective here. It's about how we view life. It's not losing sight of what God has done for you at the cross. And when we are fully engaged as a Christian with love and compassion for our fellow man, when we realize fully what God has done for us and how he has blessed us, And when we have a perspective that cares more about our salvation and the salvation of others, we don't lose heart when tragedy in our lives happens. We learn to rejoice. We rejoice that we've been saved. We rejoice for those who have gone on. We rejoice that they have won the race. And we rejoice that the battle is over and they get to go home. We rejoice. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 19, short verse, poignant passage. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Our hope, brothers and sisters, is not in this physical life. It's not here. Too many of us, too many times are living for this life. We're living for things. We're living for experiences. We're living for the things that will make us happy in this life. And we're missing the mark. We're missing the mark. Our walk as a Christian should be such that we have a spiritual perspective always. Does that mean we're not allowed to be happy in life? Of course not. And that's not what I'm talking about. But when we're living and pursuing, and that's our life's dreams, is all of the things contained in this world, we've missed the mark. We will never find true joy in life's trials if we don't have a spiritual outlook. If we don't view it through spiritual eyes, if we do not see it how God views it and have an understanding of the eternal perspective, oh, we can't have joy, can we? James 4, beginning in verse 13, James addresses a very important aspect here. He said, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away instead You ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. That's a spiritual perspective. We don't know when our time here on earth will end. We have only today. And our daily walk with Christ ought to be such that we are dependent upon Him. We seek what the Lord's will is for us from day to day. We need a mindset that acknowledges God and His plan for our lives and a vision for our our future, our eternal future. We truly do not know what tomorrow holds. But I will say this full of confidence. God does desire to have our hearts while we're here. He wants to work in our lives. He wants to work in your life. He wants to work in my life. Hebrews 13, beginning in verse 20 says, now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I want you to notice something about this. And there's a lot we could talk about here. But the writer equates God's working in your life to the same power that raised Jesus from the grave. Have you ever picked up on that? The same power that he wants to supply you in your life and in your Christian walk 
is equated to be the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Was that powerful? Was it? You bet it was. I'll take that power. Won't you? You don't think he can help you? I'm standing here today as a testament to the fact that he not only can, he will if you allow him to. He has the power to do exactly what he said he will do and he will be the source of it in you. The problem we run into often is that we don't fully want to submit to him. We want to fight this life on our own and we're not sure how to really connect with that power. But as Christians, we must understand that our life is not our own. We're bought with a price. The price of blood. A life given for us upon the cross of Calvary. And I appreciate Brother Terry uh, expressing that point in his presentation. Because that's what it all boils, boils down to. He has a plan for our lives. But I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, it might not be what you think it is or should be. Here's a revelation moment. His plan for you is not really about you. It's not about you. When we find ourselves going through various things in life, we find ourselves saying, why me? How could you let this happen to me? When in reality, it's not about me. It's not about you. God has a plan. And his plan has been since the beginning of time to save you. It's been since the beginning of time to preserve your soul. And it's been since the beginning of time to make you like his son, Jesus Christ. And to reveal his light of Christ in you to a lost and dying world. Romans 8 and verse 29 says this, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You see, we are to be conformed to his image. And you're looking at me up here on stage and you're saying, Woo, boy, does he have a long way to go. And I do. But that's the objective. That's God's plan for our lives is to be crossed to a world. And in that is to be conformed to his image. We begin talking and acting and saying and seeing and doing and everything about us becomes like Jesus would do. I know it's cliche-ish. We've heard it for many years. What would Jesus do? But it's so true. We are to be conformed to it. Now, we fail him. We stumble and we certainly don't always do what we should do and don't always show that light, do we? But I want you to know and never forget that's the objective. This is what we're practicing. This is what we're, we are striving to accomplish in our lives, in our, in our Christian maturity and development is to become more and more like our master. Why? So others are drawn to him. You know, we preach the gospel and we, pay, we, we fund Hopefully, we fund evangelistic efforts to reach the lost, right? But there's ministry opportunities in your own backyard, so to speak. We have them all around us, and it is by how we conduct our lives. And it is about letting the light of Christ be seen in our lives. It's an eternal perspective. Jesus promised that he is coming back someday to take us home. Did you know that? Surely you know that. That's a promise. He promised the day will come when there's no more pain. There's no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more trials, despair, grief. He has promised he would wipe away our very last tear. It's an eternal perspective. And you should find great joy in your salvation. You should find great joy in what he has done for you. 
But sometimes things happen that are not happy occasions, isn't there? What then? I'll confess to you as insignificant as it may be to you because you've got your own set of issues, I'm sure. But I experienced during this event a real sense of gloom, a real sense of weariness and worry, a loss of motivation, a loss of zeal and enthusiasm in my life. I let the joy be sucked right out of me. It took me a while to get a grasp and an understanding of it. Did I enjoy being sad? Did I enjoy these feelings and emotions of grief? Did I bask in the pleasure of trials? Of course not. James 1, beginning in verse 2, says this, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, I think we can safely assume having various trials will definitely not lead us to happiness. Right? I don't look forward to trials, do you? We know that's not going to bring happiness. But the reason he says to count it all joy is in the following two verses. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You see, it's what the trials produce. It's what the trials produce that we can rejoice in because we know it is God working in our lives to become more like the Master. It's an eternal perspective. Romans 5, beginning in verse 3. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Here it is again. What is wrong with these apostles who keep saying this? Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Paul encourages believers to rejoice when they encounter hardships. Why? Because God is carrying out his plans and his purposes in them to bring them to a complete and mature uh, status, if you will, in their Christian walk. You see, when bad times come, we ought to be able to say, all right, God, I don't, I don't understand it. I don't know how I'm going to get through it. I don't know the answer, but I know you do. I trust you, and I know that you'll be with me through it. And so I choose to rejoice in what I know you have in store for me. Now, that's pretty radical, isn't it? Yet the Christian life's pretty radical, if you think about it. Everything's backwards. You know, the first will be last, the last will be first. The greatest in the kingdom is the one who lowers himself like a servant and serves. That's our Christianity. And this is no different. Even in sorrow, we're to rejoice. When your trust is fully in the Lord and not in the things of this life, bad things can happen. They can, they will. But you can have a spiritual view that steadies your heart and that steadies your faith. You can have a joy down in the depths of your soul that will bring you so much peace and stability even when happiness, happiness leaves you for a bit. I know, it's bizarre. But that's because joy goes much deeper than mere happiness. You saw some definitions of happiness earlier. I want to talk about one aspect of that. What happens when happiness leaves us for a time? You know, we're not always happy, are we? Now, I meet some people and I just wonder, they must be happy all the time because they just show There's no way. Because sad things happen. Bad things, maybe, as we would define it. What about when it leaves us for a while? I can tell you, losing Kathy didn't make me happy. Seeing my children face the rest of their lives without their mother didn't make me happy. Seeing my daughter today suffer from some autoimmune disease doesn't make me happy. 
seeing two of my sons nearly lose their lives in a four-wheeler accident, in a bicycle accident, a bicycle, right? Didn't make me happy. In fact, it brought a lot of fear and a lot of concern. Seeing another one of my daughters have a condition that led to essentially brain surgery didn't make me happy. Seeing my dad today suffer from leukemia doesn't make me happy. Having a bad knee that I likely will have to have surgery on soon doesn't make me happy. Although now all of a sudden that seems trivial, doesn't it? You see, I just gave you a little snippet of some things that have happened in our lives over the years. I can give you much more, but that's not important. And you've gone through these things and had these various things happen in your life as well. I know. Welcome to life. But can I still have joy? And I propose to you that I can. Allow me to suggest a different approach in our thinking whether happy or sad, you can face what life throws at you with stability and consistent joy. And here's why. And this is so simple. Happiness is not happiness when you're sad. Right? You can't have happiness and sadness at the same time. Those are two completely opposite emotions. You're not happy, you're sad. But I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, true joy is still joy when you're sad. Of course it's joy when you're happy, but a true joy given by God above, penetrating your heart to the level that you're connected, as Brother Terry said, and that we have a relationship with one another and we understand the eternal perspective, joy is still there. It's a little dip in the road. Emotionally and physically, we may have to deal with these things. Certainly, we will. But do we lose joy? Well, we don't have to. Now, we can make a choice. We can let these things in life destroy us. Not just bring us down, but I mean destroy us. Or we can choose to maintain joy that's God-given that can regulate our lives, that can allow us to, instead of this emotional roller coaster, it'll kind of steady it out a little bit, if that makes sense. Because that's what joy does for a Christian. It it allows us to put it into a proper perspective that we can give glory to God when it's all said and done. So how do we get there? How do we find this joy in life's trials? There's so many things we could talk about. Uh, oh my goodness, you, wouldn't, you just won't believe how long this sermon was going to be. And it's been trimmed down. There's so much I would love to say, but we don't have time to say it. But I want to mention one of the most important ones, and it's been mentioned earlier. You. The family of God. What do I mean? Well, to start with, we must learn to lean on one another. And as the body of Christ, we must learn to receive those who are leaning upon us. In his infinite wisdom, God provided us a beautiful refuge we know as the church. And part of the fundamental function of the church is to serve one another, is to love one another, is to bear one another's burdens. An integral part of his plan for us is found in our brothers and sisters. And I'm not sure we recognize that like we should. A working, properly functioning body of believers will help you bear your burdens. To lift you up. They will encourage you. They will walk through this life together with you. And in the church, no man is an island. That's not God's design. His design for the church is that we are connected and we are there for each other. There is so much power in what we can do for each other in the body of Christ. And we just underestimate it. At the very core of who God's people are 
is a group of people who will not condemn you, but will be there to assist you in understanding what the Lord desires from you. Galatians 6, verse 2, I mentioned it. But bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. This was another challenge for me to decide whether to, to bring this up, but I will. I cut other things so I could say this. I wouldn't have made it through that. And I'm telling you, I was going through a little bit of a dark time. A lot of people don't know that because I hid. And I could fake it pretty well. And that's why I say we need to be there for each other because you don't really know what's going on behind the scenes. A lot of you reached out to me and to my family. And I'm sorry if I get a little emotional because I'm that kind of cut that way. If you know my dad, then I guess you know why. But you reached out to us in a lot of ways. A lot of ways. I can't even possibly enumerate those ways in which people reached out to me personally. But I want to tell you quickly about two occasions. And it's just an example of what was done for me. There was a woman who had lost her husband, I guess within a year or earlier prior to Kathy uh, going home, that had written me a letter. She, she hand wrote a multi-page letter to me. Oh, I got it about two or three weeks after Kathy's passing, maybe a month. And it was a sister in Christ. And I'm not going to give you a lot of details. She, as well as you, will never know the power that was in that, in her encouraging me to be, to accept, to be able to recognize God's infinite love for me, to not question God, but to trust Him. That letter was pivotal for me. Even though it still took me a while, I kept coming back to that letter. Powerful to me. She made a sacrifice to reach out to me in that way. Because she knew what I was going through. I will forever be grateful. And then there's a precious family that I've been friends with for years and years. About six months went by, and I received a note, a card, with a CD. And in that note from the couple, they said, we've really struggled with how to reach out to you or to say anything, and I know I've not said anything yet. It's been six months, right? But I just never could really find the words, and nothing felt right to say to you until I heard this song. Now, y'all know I'm a sucker for songs. But when I heard this song, and this song is called, I believe the title was, Someone is Praying for You. She said, when I heard that song, I thought of you. And that's simply what I wanted to tell you. Is that we're praying for you. And I love the song. I thank them so much for the song that they sent me because it blessed my heart. But the, that, that doesn't seem very significant, does it? Those are really small things in the big scheme. You'll never know how powerful little actions, little deeds for somebody who's going through any kind of trial, how powerful those things are to them from their brothers and sisters in Christ. It's cliche-ish again. I'm going to give you another one. But I truly do not know how people without faith or a church family make it through such events where they don't have people to lean on. And I've seen them. I know them. And you do too. I don't know about you. Can't speak for you, but I'll speak for me. Brothers and sisters, I'm weak. What I discovered in that two-year period of time was how weak I was. Unbelievable. I wasn't supposed to be weak. In fact, I even 
Previous to that thought, I could handle that kind of thing. It wouldn't matter. Wouldn't be that tough. I'm weak. I needed prayers and encouragement from the church. And as I received them, I certainly received a lot of strength from above. You know the Apostle Paul, and it may be hard for us to grasp this. It is for me. But he went through many trials. He wrote about it a lot, right? He's the one that told us to have joy in the middle of this a lot. But in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9, the Apostle Paul prayed three times to have a thorn removed from him. Now, I'm not concerning myself with what the thorn was. It doesn't really matter to me. I want you to get the principle behind what Paul said here. He felt like it was hindering him. It was important to him. He prayed three times. He got an answer from the Lord. It wasn't what he desired. It wasn't. And we read here in verse 9, it says my, what the Lord said to him. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul couldn't handle this problem by himself. It was serious enough that he prayed to the Lord three times to have it removed. It wasn't a passing prayer. I kind of picture it much like perhaps the Lord in the garden praying three times to remove the cup that he was about to face. Three times. Maybe there's some significance in praying about it three times and we need to accept where God's at. I don't know. But it was serious enough to Paul. Yet he submitted himself to the Lord. He was able to deal with it by the power or the strength that Christ provided him. And he knew and recognized with an eternal perspective that Christ is getting the glory, right? Because I can't physically or I can't emotionally or I can't however deal with this problem. And so the Lord lifts him up and sustains him. And people are drawn to that and not him. And that's who Paul was pushing it toward. Who gets the glory? Paul? The Lord. While well-intended, I often heard statements like, you are so strong. What a great example of how to deal with a loss. I'm so impressed with your faith. Honestly, I got tired of hearing that. I just did. I learned to remind them when I would hear those kind of words that God is strong, I'm weak. And it's only by what God provides me and what God teaches me in how to handle these things that I can move on, that I can move forward, that I can even possibly remotely be able to deal with life and, and to move on in a way that glorifies Him. This was certainly no good in me. Any strength or good you might have seen in me was from the Lord. I don't deserve any glory on that anyway. It's about Him. So I give Him all the credit. It was God working in my life. And I hope that you can say the same thing about whatever you go through. What I wanted to do in the flesh was crawl in a hole. That's what I wanted to do. And the Lord kept me from that. Praise God. He was strong. I leaned heavily upon Christ to work in me a proper perspective. And you know much of what helped me were simple verses that I had memorized over the years. Things like, we've been made more than conquerors. He will supply all our needs. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And then there's Philippians 4 and verse 13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. You know, Paul didn't say, or pen, I can do all things, period. And just leave it at that. He didn't say that, did he? He didn't accept any of that glory. A lot of times we, we hear or we say, you've got the power within you. You can do this. And then they do it. And you, yes, I knew you could do it. Spiritually speaking, 
We need to get a grasp that it's not about us. It's about Christ who gives us the strength to be able to go on, who gives us the strength to overcome, who gives us the strength to supply or to take care of the needs that we have. I had a decision to make. I had to decide if I was going to believe these verses or not. And if not, what am I doing here? What am I doing pretending to be a Christian? I either have a faith in God that He's going to do exactly what He said He's going to do, or I'm going to walk away. Brothers and sisters, there's a choice to be made in this. Do we really believe Him? Do we believe God will do what He said He will do? Can you really believe that? Can you trust that? And I propose to you that you better. (laughs) You can trust Him. You know, we think about faithfulness or, or trusting people, and there's not a lot of that that goes around anymore, right, in our society. Uh, we have the development of contracts, and, and even contracts get skewed and sued and everything else, right? Because we don't have trust on anybody anymore. But I want to tell you something. Our God's not like you and me. His ways are far above ours, and you can trust Him. And if He says that you can do all things through Christ who will give you the strength, you can believe it, brothers and sisters. It's time to believe what the Bible says and what the promises are that he's given us. Who has the upper hand? The Holy Spirit living inside you? Or Satan? Really? I have to ask. Does God have all power over you? Is he able to deliver you? Is he able to supply all your need? Yes, of course, he is. Do we believe he will do what he said he will do? If not, what are we doing? What are we doing? Why do we go through these motions if it's not true? Now, I propose to you what I have found out was that I can affirm very strongly that God will, in fact, do, in fact, has done exactly what he said he will do. And he has done it in my life. I implore you, quit living for this life. Quit living for the flesh. Concerning yourself with what tomorrow will bring. And begin living for our eternal abode. Our eternal reward. Have your eyes set on the goal, and that's heaven above. Your heavenly Father knows your every need. And he will supply according to his promises and according to his will. Our job is to trust him, to believe him, to be faithful. Which reminds me, I need to do one more thing for my joy. And I think you do too. And we need to learn to forgive. I had the opportunity, I had the opportunity to meet the man that drove the truck that ultimately was involved in the accident that killed my wife. It was a very humbling experience for me. It was about two years later. And what I found out about him, you know, because we don't always know what all's going on. Behind the scenes, what I found out was this man was married, had been for 20 some odd years. Lived in Tennessee. Had a wife and four children. And after the accident, he went to his boss and said, I can't do it anymore. He had driven for this company for a long time. And for a couple of years, he's doing side jobs and he's trying to make a living and do what he... But it tore him up that that incident happened and boy did that grab me because you know generally speaking in life people really don't have ill will not generally and especially in these things 
He didn't launch out that morning with an intent to see if he could take somebody out. It wasn't his idea. He was trying to move a piece of equipment that he was hired to do. And there's a lot more to the story I could share with you, but that's really not important. What I found out was a, he was a very real individual that had a life, and his life had been shattered too. More on the inside probably, but it really bothered him, and it, he, he struggled with that. And I shook his hands and embraced him, and I don't say this to lift myself up. In fact, this was more for me. <laughs> it's what I needed to do. I told him, I said, I don't know if this is important to you, if this means anything to you at all. But I forgive you. I do, I do not hold any bitterness or ill will toward you. I want only the best for you. I am so sorry that this happened. But I want you to know that me, I, do not hold you responsible personally I want you to know that you are not responsible I want you if I had a wish would be that you could get back out and do the thing that you love to do and go drive that truck again brothers and sisters what I really I knew I needed to do that what I underestimated was its power in my life because when I did that, it was almost no time at all. I mean, within a week or two or three, it's just like, we're done. I can go on. I can live. And you know what I needed to do? Was forgive him. <laughs> now, I didn't necessarily have to speak it to him, although that helped. I'm glad I had that opportunity. But to have an attitude of forgiveness, brothers and sisters, some of you are hurting because somebody's offended you. Somebody's hurting you because other things, rather than just tragedy or sadness or sickness, you've really been hurt and you're struggling in your Christian walk and you really want to know whether to give up or not. Can I tell you? Can I tell you? It's time to forgive. And it's time to let God do his work on you and let God do his work on the offending party. You know, when Kathy passed away, Ty had reminded me and the family of an important fact to remember. And I have repeated it many, many times. Some of you have heard me say so. Maybe you've heard him say it. But it was such a profound, simple, but profound statement. I know, coming from Ty Profound. Love you, brother. No, this is what he told me. Speaking of Kathy's death and that moment of her death, this was what he said. I believe I have the quote right. That this is the moment in which she spent her life practicing for. This is the moment in which she spent her life practicing for. You see, he didn't say preparing for. He didn't say living for. This is the moment she lived. All of those would be true. The word he used was practicing. And I don't know how that strikes you when you really think about it, but it was just a gigantic slap in the face. It was a wake-up to me. That what she did and what we should be doing is practicing for our inevitable future. That's why we go to this, the assemblies regularly. We're practicing to serve God. That's why we serve one another we practice our faith. That's why we practice to encourage one another in the body of Christ. That's why we share the gospel with others. We're practicing our faith. We're putting it in action, in motion. Brothers and sisters, practice what you believe. 
I've learned a lot since her passing, but mostly I have learned this, that it's not about this life. And we can be filled with joy knowing that this life is temporary. And we have a home in heaven awaiting for us. Our hearts can overflow with joy knowing that we're here for God's purposes. It's not about me, it's about Him. And when we take on this spiritual or eternal perspective, we'll be filled with true joy and experience a life full of love for Christ and full of love for each other. We'll understand it's not about us. And if we truly believe that God will keep us or keep His promises and work through our lives in order to bless others, we will have such a blessed and joyful life. A joyful life that's truly inexpressible. We will have that peace that surpasses all understanding. And most importantly, we'll be prepared for His coming at the great and final day. One more verse. Romans 8 and verse 18 Paul again writes, said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What in the world are we doing? Why are we worried? Why, are, why do we struggle? Oh, I still will, I know. I'm just asking the question, why? When we know what has been promised for us, this life is nothing in the big scheme of our eternity. It's nothing. It's just a vapor. Let's work while we're here. Let's be active while we're here. Let's practice our faith while we're here. But let's rejoice when it's time to go on. Quit complaining. Quit drawing attention away from what God does or can do in your life. Quit magnifying your problems. And like John and Peter and Paul and other apostles... And the first century martyrs for that matter. That's a humbling thing. Read, it, read some of those accounts. Quit magnifying our problems. And draw attention to the Lord and what He is doing in your life. And if we must suffer for it or die for it, we will learn. We will train ourselves. And we will practice living our life according to the image of Christ. God bless you.